in the Acts of the Apostles. We're actually in the middle of Paul's first missionary journey, and we're reading today in Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. If you've difficulty finding that, then find the beginning of the New Testament and read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and you come to the Acts of the Apostles. Acts chapter 14. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went, as usual, into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there, speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of His grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided, some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders, to mistreat them and to stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lycaonian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country, where they continued to preach the good news. In Lystra, there sat a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. and Paul looked directly at him and saw that he had faith to be healed and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lycaonian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting, Men, why are you doing this? We too are only men, human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way. Yet, he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, I wonder what they did when they were gathering around him. He got up and went back into the city. And the next day he and Barnabas left for Derby. They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church, and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came into Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. And from Atalia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how He had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. <clears throat> 
The Acts of the Apostles, which we are studying together on Sunday mornings, was, of course, inspired by God for you and for me. But it was not written either to you or to me. It was written to an isolated and unknown individual called Theophilus. And it was written for Theophilus probably in order to help him to understand that in God's purposes for his people, two things always go hand in hand. Number one, that God is keeping the promise that Jesus made that the gospel would extend to the end of the earth and to the end of the ages. In the opening verses of Acts chapter 1, Jesus tells the little band of disciples that they are to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and ultimately to the ends of the earth. And the Acts of the Apostles, which begins with that statement, ends with the Apostle Paul at the center of the earth in those days, the great capital city of the Roman Empire, Rome itself. And the last words of the Acts of the Apostles, as we've sometimes noticed, are, without hindrance. He was preaching the gospel without hindrance. And between these two bookends, Luke is telling his friend Theophilus the story of the triumph of the gospel to the ends of the earth and to the center of the empire. But the other thing that we have noticed inevitably that is woven into that story of the triumph of the gospel is the story of the trials of the apostles, which lie behind and are so often God's way of moving forward the triumph of the gospel. As for Christ, no cross, no crown, so for the victory of the Christian church, no cross, no crown. And perhaps it's partly because of that. No cross, no crown. No crown without a cross. But the early disciples, faithful as they were, were so slow to bring the gospel to the ends of the age. And we've noted up until the beginning of chapter 13, it's almost as though God has had to keep nudging them because they have been so reluctant to do anything. First of all, persecution had spread them. Then we noticed in a couple of instances with Philip speaking to an Ethiopian and the Apostle Peter speaking to a Roman centurion and his household that special individual revelation began to send them to the Gentiles. But it's only at the beginning of chapter 13 that we've seen the church moving from needing persecution or revelation to being willing to accept the God-given mission of Jesus Christ to take the gospel not only to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. And God has given this little church at Antioch this tremendous burden by the Holy Spirit so that they have now sent out two of their leading figures on whom they depended so much, Barnabas and Paul himself with a very clear strategy. And that's underlined at the end of chapter 14. They weren't simply going wherever the sea would take them or the wind would blow. They had a very fixed, clear strategy. And chapter 14, verse 26, speaks about the way in which they had been committed to the grace of God for this work which they had now completed. And that strategy was that these two men would make a round trip of somewhere in the region of a thousand miles through Barnabas' native area and then through the Apostle Paul's native area in order to bring the gospel to the Gentiles as well as to the Jews. And this 14th chapter tells us how they moved First of all, through Crete, and then had crossed to the mainland, gone up northwards to Antioch, and now they are moving ever so generally in an easterly direction through the cities of Iconium and Lystra and Derbe, 
to the very edge of Asia Minor. And then they will return at the end of the chapter and report to God's people in Antioch of what God has done. Now, all the details of God's work in Acts chapter 14, I think, can be summed up in three pairs of words. The first pair is this, that as they visit Iconium at the beginning of the chapter, their visit is marked by proclamation and poisoning. Proclamation and poison. As is their custom, we're told here, they go first of all to the Jews. Verse 1, believing, as Paul says in Romans 1, that the gospel must first of all be preached to the Jews whom God had prepared to receive the Messiah. And then it must go out to the ends of the earth. And they preach the same message they have preached everywhere. What Luke here describes as the message of God's grace. In verse 3, they spent a considerable time speaking, and God confirmed the message of His grace. They spoke of a gospel that was free, a gospel that required no qualifications to people who were used to thinking in terms of qualifying for the grace of God. They said sinners cannot qualify for God's grace. They can only depend upon God's grace as a free gift. And you'll notice how Luke adds the style of their preaching. Again in verse 3, they spent a considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord. That's a word that literally means all speech. And it's used frequently in the New Testament to designate what happens when God's Holy Spirit fills the person who is speaking the Word of God, either privately or publicly. There is such a sense of God's grace and power as they speak that they are able to speak boldly for the Lord Jesus Christ. You see that wherever there is revival, incidentally that people are able to say things from pulpits and in personal conversation in days when there is revival that would be regarded as personal insults in ordinary times because God's Spirit is at work preparing hearts to receive God's Word. And so they spoke with great boldness and their message was confirmed by these Miraculous signs. And in the Acts of the Apostles, incidentally, miraculous signs are always confirmations of those who bring the gospel with a new revelation of Jesus Christ. And the effect, well, we're told they spoke so effectively in such a way, verse 1, that a great number of both Jews and Gentiles believed. Now, if you've been with us reading through the Acts of the Apostles or read through the Acts of the Apostles on your own, you don't need Luke to tell you what's going to happen next. Just under the surface of everything that Luke writes in the Acts of the Apostles are the words of Jesus. I am going to build my church. All hell will be let loose but the gates of hell will not be able to hold back the advance of the church. And so wherever this happens, the power of God coming, the people speaking with great boldness, many people coming to faith in Christ, we should anticipate that all hell will be let loose. Why? Because Jesus Christ is building here in order to destroy the kingdom of Satan. And you see in this instance how all hell is let loose in the verbs that Luke uses to describe the response. They refused to believe. They refused to believe. You see here the word of God had been spoken about the grace of God to these people, the fulfillment of God's promises in the Old Testament to these people. And in addition to the truth of his word, God had confirmed the truth of the gospel by these miracles 
these signs that the gospel was true. There was all the evidence mortal man would need to believe in Jesus Christ. But they refused to believe in Jesus Christ. It wasn't that they didn't make the connection. It wasn't that the gospel was too difficult to understand. It was that their hearts were hardened and nothing would change them. Now you know that, don't you? You have seen that. I have seen that. You explain the gospel to people. You explain some part of the Bible to people. It doesn't matter how true it is or how clear it is. They're not going to believe it. Because their hearts have been hardened. But you see, it's characteristic of hardened hearts that they are never prepared to be isolated hearts. And so those who have hardened their heart against the gospel then, do you notice, stir up in a union with others, they stir up the people against the apostles in a very strange union that you see appearing again and again in the Acts of the Apostles. Verse 5, there was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews. These people were neither on eating terms nor on speaking terms. But they were joined powerfully by this hostility to the Lord Jesus Christ. Strange alliances against the Word of God and the Gospel of Christ are always the work of Satan. And it is always the work of Satan to create very strange alliances in order to destroy the work of God. And those with hardened hearts who will not be alone in their heart hardness Now, I'm not content with that, but of course they want to poison the minds of those who have begun to be drawn to the gospel. And like something out of Hamlet, the way in which to poison the minds of people is to pour the poison into the ear. And they begin their little whispering campaign. Just a little drop does it. You don't actually need to say something that's false about the apostles. You just need to give the little hints. And the result is that the plot succeeds. And the gates of hell, while they do not prevail, make it necessary for the apostles to move on. So the story in Iconium is a story of proclamation and poison. And it's a story intended to teach Theophilus, whoever he was, and to teach us that we cannot be faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ as a fellowship or as individuals scattered throughout the city without some of these things beginning to happen. Strange, anomalous unions of hostility against us. Poisonous words whispered in dark and secret places against us. But it is in this very context that Jesus Christ will build his church. And the gates even of hell will not be able to prevail. So then they move on to Lystra. And if Iconium is a story of proclamation and poison, Lystra is a story of transformation and tribulation. Luke had mentioned in the first part of the chapter that there were miracles, but he hadn't given any description of them because he knows that when he comes to tell us the story of what took place in Lystra, there is a very interesting miracle took place there. Among many miracles, there is one particular miracle that Luke takes hold of because he knows it it will convey something very special to the readers of the Acts of the Apostles and to his friend Theophilus. You look at that story. It's the story of a man who is crippled in his feet, lame from birth, has never walked. Paul says to him, stand up on your feet. As he looks into his eyes, the man jumps up and he begins to walk. Now, if you've been following through the Acts of the Apostles, you're bound to think, I think I've heard this before. 
Wasn't this exactly what happened in Acts chapter 3 in the case of Peter? And isn't this almost modeled on what happened in Acts chapter 3? The man's in the same condition. Paul does the same thing. He looks at him intently, tells him to stand on his feet, and the result is the same. Well, of course, that that is exactly Luke's point. He's wanting us to see as he is telling the story of the gospel standing at the gate of the pagan world that the needs of the people and the power of the gospel are just the same here among pagans as they were there in Jerusalem, that the same power of God that was present in Peter's ministry there at the beginning of the church is now present in the ministry of Paul and Barnabas as the church moves out to conquer a Gentile and a pagan world. The same things happen, the same grace is evident because the same basic needs are present. And he's giving this wonderful illustration. This is why he selects this particular narrative, this particular miracle, because he's wanting you to think, this reminds me of what happened in Jerusalem. Yes, he's saying, that's exactly what I want you to be reminded of. Because I want you to see the way in which the same gospel will meet the same needs among different people scattered throughout the world. But that transformation leads at first, actually, to great confusion. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lycaonian language, and that little phrase is immensely significant, the gods have come down to us in human form. Now, there was a reason they said that, given their pagan religion, because there was a, there was a story actually recorded a number of years before this in the writings of the Roman author Ovid in his his book on the gods changing into human form. Ovid recorded a story that was told in this very part of Asia Minor of how the two gods, Zeus and Hermes, had come down to this very vicinity and they'd gone round in the disguise of men and they'd been asking if there would be people who would put them up for a night. And they went round a thousand homes and nobody would put them up until they came to this home of a poor old pair of buddies who took them in and made them welcome. And the gods rewarded them by turning their house into a temple and rewarded the other thousand by destroying every single piece of property they owned. And believing that and seeing this, It wasn't surprising that the old priest here comes running out with his bull behind him and the wreaths just as quickly as his physical condition will allow to say, please don't do that again. But what Luke focuses attention on is not the way in which that story seemed to be relived in the minds of the people of Lystra but the response of the Apostle Paul. What is so striking to look about their response is that they don't view this with amusement as a piece of naivety. They view this as horror, as a deep expression, revelation of the awful idolatry and fear in which these people are caught. You see this throughout the Acts. But when he goes to Athens, Paul goes to Athens, and he's there in a sense as a tourist, but he doesn't have the eyes of a tourist. He's the eyes of somebody who knows what it is to be blessed with the gospel, and he's horrified by what he sees. Because it's all an expression of the bondage of this paganism in which these men and women have been caught. But what is he to say? Well, he acts, first of all, they tear their clothes, they run and say, stop, stop, Let, let's explain, stop, listen. But you see, he can't say to these pagans what he had said to the people in the synagogue at Antioch. He can't say to them, do you remember this psalm and this psalm? Do you remember this psalm and this psalm? It's all being fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He can't say that to them. These people don't have the Bible. 
And so he makes his point of contact, first of all, with where they are. And he teaches them truths that are found in the Bible without actually telling them they need to look up the Bible. Because he wants to open their eyes as he looks at the creation with the opened eyes of a Christian believer. He wants them to see what he sees. The way in which God has displayed his amazing goodness in creation and in providence. The kindness that he's shown to them. The lavishness of his goodness to them. The fact that he provides them with plenty of food and fills their hearts not with fear but with joy. That's the true and living God. And perhaps because he knows he's going to go on in the story to a similar sermon in Acts chapter 17. Well, he'll tell this story fully from Paul's lips. Because his real interest here is not so much in the story that Paul tells, but in the tribulation that Paul experiences. That he cuts the story off and says, even with these words, verse 18, they had difficulty keeping the crowds from sacrificing to them. And then... And then the mafia come. Jews from Antioch and Iconium. Here were men who were giving up a day's wages, who had banded together, who had gone out of their way to go to Iconium to bring others so that they could continue their militant assault against the gospel of Jesus Christ and the building of Christ's kingdom here in Lystra. And they won the crowd over. And the mob stones Paul, it believes, to death. Yes, we're seeing the general fulfillment here of Jesus' promise in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. The gospel has now actually begun to penetrate to the pagan recesses of the Roman province of Asia Minor. But Luke also wants us to see that there is another promise of Jesus that is being fulfilled here. A promise that he had recorded was given to Saul of Tarsus through Ananias. Go, the Lord said to Ananias in Acts 9.15, This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. There are two promises being fulfilled. There is the general promise that Christ has given to the whole church. There is the particular promise that Christ has given to Saul of Tarsus about his particular distinctive role in the church. And as Paul eventually was to realize, looking back on his life, he began to realize that Christ had called him to be a kind of enormous illustration of the principles by which God builds his church and works in the life of every single individual believer, that triumph comes hand in hand with and through the means of tribulation. Or to put it in a word, spreading the gospel which is free to those who receive it is never cheap to those who spread it. And there's a reason for that. It is because those of us who seek to spread the gospel publicly and privately are speaking of a gospel that has at its very heart the savage death of our Savior and His glorious, triumphant resurrection. And if there is going to be authenticity about the message that we speak, it shouldn't surprise us that there are fragments of that message that stick into our lives. So the trials that we experience as we seek to be faithful witnesses For Jesus Christ, as Peter says, should never take us by surprise. Nor should they be an indication to us that those who oppose the gospel are triumphing. But an indication to us that the pattern that God used for such eternal fruitfulness in our Savior Jesus Christ 
in these large scale lives of Stephen the martyr and Paul the apostle, that these fragments will stick into our lives too. And so, like Stephen before him, the Apostle Paul gives all for Christ. And then they move on to Derbe, and in verse 21, preach the good news with similar effect, and they return. Yes, they do. They return, first of all, to Lystra, where he was stoned. They go back to Iconium, where there was a plot against them. They return to Antioch, where that plot had begun. And on their return journey back to their hometown of Antioch, their experience is one of consolidation and communication. Consolidation of the churches by, you notice, teaching them the very thing that we've been learning here that it's through much tribulation that we must enter the kingdom of God. You see, Luke has been preparing us for this. We've seen it in Paul and Barnabas and their fellow disciples. Now, Paul with great authenticity, because they can see on him the marks of the Lord Jesus, is spelling it out for them. It's written into the very essence of the Christian life that it's through tribulation that we enter the kingdom of God. And notice that they're encouraging them with these words. These are encouraging words to genuine Christians who know what it is to struggle, genuine Christians who know what it is to experience persecution. This is the divinely ordained way. And we're on that way to the triumph of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then in order to encourage them, they appoint elders to care for them in every place. And you'll notice that they do that with prayer and fasting. It's that important to be an elder. And it's that important to have elders. And after going through Pisidia and Pamphylia, preaching the word in Perga, down to Atalia, They come back to Antioch where they had been committed to the grace of God and they'd certainly experienced it for the work that they'd now completed and they'd certainly completed it. And on gathering, arriving there, they gather the church and tell them how sore they are. No, they tell them what God has done through them and how he's opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. It was as Paul looked back on this that he wrote later on to his friends in the church at Corinth. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that Jesus' life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in others. Do you know Amy Carmichael's great prayer and poem? Lord crucified, O mark your holy cross on motive, preference, all fond desire, on that which self in any form inspires, set thou that sign of loss. And when the touch of death is here and there displayed upon a thing most precious in our eyes, Let us not wonder. Let us see the answer to this prayer. It is through much tribulation that the people of God enter the kingdom of God. 
because the shape of every true church Jesus Christ builds is built in the shape of the cross. Proclamation and poison. Transformation and tribulation. Consolidation and communication of what God does through his people. Well, pray God we may all want to be part of such a people. And pray God that he will give us grace, whatever trials we face in our faithfulness to Jesus Christ, to see beyond the trials to the glorious triumph. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you set before us in your word a mirror in which we see reflected in the lives of your servants the pattern that you use among all your people. We come to you confessing how we tremble that such a shape should be pressed down upon our lives. And yet we know that this is the most blessed shape, the most blessed mold in all the world, because by it you transform us into the likeness of your Son, to whom we seek to bear daily witness. We bow before you and pray that in ever what ways, miniature or large, you should set upon our lives the sign of the cross, that you would enable us to rejoice in your grace and to serve Jesus Christ with great fruitfulness. And we ask it together for his great name's sake.